here with Unit 4. My name is Ellen Zwornstein, and I get to be your facilitator. I'm the executive director at the Michigan Center for Civic Education, which oversees our We the People program. And the judges will introduce themselves. They will ask you to introduce yourselves, and then we'll begin with the hearing. Hi, everybody. I'm Ann Zinken. I am a career law clerk at the New Hampshire Supreme Court. I've been here for about 21 years. I litigated in employment cases in San Francisco. The first nine years of my life were spent in Wayne, New Jersey, so I have no idea where in New Jersey you're from, but I have an affinity for New Jersey. Um, and I've been judging at the state level for somewhere between five and 10 years. Judge Anderson. Thank you. Um, I'm an associate justice on the Minnesota Supreme Court. I'm the senior justice on the court. That basically means I've hung around for a long time. Um, I uh, actually have some experience with this program, not only as a judge for many years, but also years ago as a coach, uh, assistant coach to a team from Hutchinson, Minnesota. And I have some appreciation for all the work you've put in and the nervousness that you might be currently experiencing. We're going to have a great conversation. I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely. I'm Hank Chambers, law professor down here at University of Richmond. I've been at this for, gosh, probably two decades, almost a quarter of a century now. Um, so it's been, it's been fun so far, and I guarantee you this morning we're going to have some fun as well. So it's good to see you all. If y'all could introduce yourselves, we'd appreciate it. Hello, my name is Lauren. I'm a currently a senior at Western Plains Rural High School North, and I'll pass it off to Freen. Hi, I'm Efreen. I'm also a senior at High School North, and I'll pass it to Mega. Hi, I'm Mega. I'm a junior at West Windsor Plains for High School North. And your coach, if you'd introduce us to him. Our well, coach is Mr. Paulson, uh, or yeah, I don't want to say his first name. Is that <laughs> Mr. Paulson, uh, do you want to um, tell us about yourself? Oh, good morning. So uh, my name is Albert Paulson. These are my, uh, my amazing students in a course called uh, Introduction of Political and Legal Experiences. And uh, the We the People program is, is really the, uh, the cornerstone of the, uh, the experience. Awesome. All right. So we are here with unit four and we are doing question two. After I read the question, you should feel free to start your presentation. Members of Congress are not only legislators, but they are also inquisitorial and should meet frequently to inspect the conduct of the public officers. How effectively do you believe Congress has used its investigatory powers? Explain the differences, if any, between Congress's power to investigate and the power of oversight. Which power, in your opinion, is more significant? How effectively do you believe con Congress has used its oversight powers? Our Constitution gives many implied powers to the government, especially to Congress, such as the powers of investigation and oversight. The investigatory power allows them to be able to uncover instances of abuses of power as well as corruption. However, we do believe that today, Congress has not been effectively using its powers of investigation. Over the years, Congress has performed many highly influential and important hearings, one of which includes the unveiling of the Watergate scandal. The investigation was successful in leading to the discovery of Nixon wiretapping and illegally recording conversations. And as a result, Nixon resigned when he faced almost certain impeachment. Partisanship is a prime example of the declining use of this power since it has become a liability of them using these powers. Such biases cause hesitation to do things against their own party, despite it being better for the well-being of the country. Partisan investigators are easily seen over the past two years. The hearings against former President Trump, no matter how true and important they were, were unfair and had a partisan bias. The bias reigned true for both political parties, neither with the intention of coming to a bipartisan conclusion, whether their side was correct or not. It was no longer about morality, but rather an investigation about who has more power. Partisanship has usurped the desire for good governance. The influence of investigation has changed in recent years, and so it is inaccurate to say that the Congress has used its investigatory powers well. Like mentioned about partisanship, Congress's powers to investigate is very similar to the power of oversight. The main difference is that oversight allows Congress to review and monitor certain situations, as well as supervise federal agencies. Because of all these advantages that oversight has to offer, we believe that the power of oversight is more significant, but is, it has not been used effectively. Originally, Congress's implied investigatory powers were delegated to specific committees whose role was to gather information for future legislation. Um, 
test the effectiveness of current laws, and lay out the groundwork for impeachment proceedings. Congressional oversight, on the other hand, refers to review, monitoring, and supervision of federal agencies, programs, and policy implementation, and it provides legislative branch with an opportunity to inspect, examine, review, and check the executive branch and its agencies. However, in 2013, Edward Snowden leaked highly classified U.S. mass surveillance information that was under the radar for several years, minimal, minimal congressional oversight, illustrating that Congress has not been doing its due diligence. With the power of investigation, Congress is able to uncover and ask people to testify on matters of political abuse and corruption, leading to possible impeachments, removal from office, and harsh punishments. With the Snowden case, we can see that Congress isn't even using its power of oversight, completely neglecting many Americans. Congress has the power to cut up the spending of the military in places like Afghanistan, where the war is unnecessary and unneeded, but they have not until this point. Congress has used its oversight powers in the past, such as in 1949 when a select Senate subcommittee discovered corruption with the administration of Pre President Harry S. Truman. As a result, several agencies were reorganized and a special White House commission was appointed to investigate evidence of corruption in all areas of government. Likewise, a large aspect of the oversight power is to monitor money being spent the way it's supposed to be, as well as people are doing their jobs properly. Yet our country is in such debt, steep debt right now, which is 28 million, 20 $28 trillion, with Americans collectively owing around $1.6 trillion, according to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. If the purpose of this implied and now overlooked powers to oversee funds, and we are living beyond our means, Congress is not making effective use of oversight powers. Ultimately, Congress has not used its oversight powers effectively, since we are overall seeing a lack of responsibility from the government to monitor the way our country is using our funds, putting not only the country, but the average American at greater risk. In the past, Congress has used its oversight powers in an effective manner. And if we go back to that, it would be an extremely positive effect on America and Congress itself. Thank you. Thank you. So my question is, if Congress is an inherently political body, how can we ameliorate or eradicate politics from the investigative function? I do not believe that we want to take out the aspect of politics, but instead take out the blinding partisanship. Politics is one thing, but another thing is unable to come to a consensus on a matter that directly affects the public. Putting your party before you put your people, the people that elected you into office. So of course politics will remain, but we do believe that a level of politics should remain to a point that they are still helping their constituents instead of simply looking at their party. Do you have any ideas about possible reforms? Well, a possible reform could be that uh, there's a certain level of checks that are put into place to see if the intention of the Congress member is true or not, and to also have everything as it is already aired out publicly, like to have all that information out in the open is a way to have the American people be involved in the process, which is what we want is the American people to be heard. So, so let, me, let me ask this question. You, you all noted that we should go back to the old days uh, because the old days were better. Were the old days better in terms of partisanship and politics and investigations? I would say it was, and I would use the example of President Nixon as the the investigation on him. There was a true, there was a there was an ending goal. There was everyone agreed that what he had done was un, unfair and it was not right. And it was he, at the end he did have to resign, and there was a lot of political struggle. But at the end of the day justice was served and he did have to resign. And so, going, yeah. I'm so sorry, but going off of Afrin, we can then compare the investigation of what happened with President Nixon to what has happened in the last two impeachments that we have seen with President Trump. Um, like we mentioned in our, um, in what we said, there was a lot of partisan bias, not just from the Republicans, but from the Democrats as well. There was no clear goal other than the Republicans wanting to 
block the removal and Democrats wanting to go forward with the removal, no matter, without regarding what he had actually done. So there is a lot of partisan bias that we've just seen in the in in, in recent years. Wasn't there a, a a report from the Department of Justice from the uh, special counsel that got into what happened with the Trump administration before the impeachment, his first impeachment? Uh, I think that we aren't familiar with that, but. Okay, okay, that's all right, okay. Let me ask you a, a question about um, sort of, well, let, let me phrase it this way. I'm wondering what powers Congress has ceded to the executive and judicial branches. And I'm assuming here that they have, because you, you indicate in your statement, you point to the um, Afghan, Afghanistan situation as an example of that. And what should Congress do to unseed or take back the powers that it has ceded to the executive and judicial branches, if any? I believe that some a, a power that is has been abused a little bit that is that's been given to the executive branch is presidents um, exerting their executive privilege um, to kind of uh, go back to my other colleagues' points about um, Trump and Nixon. Um, back when Nixon during his term, he really exert asserted his he tried to ex assert his executive privilege by trying to block. The, the, the tapes that incriminated him and his staff. Um, and I believe that the exe that executive privilege is, a, is can be abused and we've seen instances of it being abused. And I believe that's a power that Congress should have um, more control over that or more say in that way, uh, this doesn't continue to happen. And we don't see as the way Trump had in his uh, term and also Nixon's, how they've what, tried, even it's not successful. Sorry. What other powers might there be other than executive privilege? Although I think that's a good example. The emergency powers. Um, I, I remember studying about them while I was studying for my AP Gov test. So forgive me if I don't know like specifics, but um, the emergency powers were something that Congress had and then they ceded to the executive branch. So the executive branch have com has complete control over when to use um, the, those said emergency powers. Now, now it is up to one body to decide when to declare an emergency or not, even while there are dozens, if not many more active emergencies currently, which Congress could vote on and pass quicker than one singular body. Okay. Let me ask about oversight. You guys done a good job on investigation. But one of the things y'all suggested in the opening was that oversight was there to help Congress supervise federal agencies. Can you explain what you mean by supervise? Because that sounds like an executive function. Right. So like what, what, what we meant by supervise was ensure that everything is running properly, which is why we, we brought in that example of what Edward Snowden leaked. Um, that was all happening under the radar and Congress was not overseeing that. They were not ensuring that that was happening, that something that maybe wasn't completely right was happening and it was up to one singular person to release that information to the public. So by oversight, what we meant was ensure that everything is running properly and correctly. Okay. To build off my colleague Megan's point, also we can cite the example that just recently happened about um, the whole, the Wall Street, GameStop, all of that um, as an example of oversight The Congress the congressional power of oversight not really being done properly as the whole like the whole world almost freaked out about it. So I believe that's another example of that. So, so, so forgive me, but let me push this a little bit. The, the Securities and Exchange Commission in theory ought to be responsible for a lot of those issues. How, how, what's the demarcation between what the executive should be doing and what Congress should be doing? Well, 
Um, the Supreme Court did determine that the framers intended for Congress to seek out information and they have all of the legislative powers. And so I think that um, Sorry. I think I think what Afreen was trying to say is with with the Supreme Court's decision of um, what oversight powers entail for for Congress, we do believe that while we don't exactly know a, a complete demarcation, we do believe that a lot of the powers do overlap. So if 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 Congress does something that the executive branch was supposed to do, we don't think that that's a very big you know. Gotcha. Thank yeah. you. How would you measure the Oops, effect? I think we've, our time has expired. <laughs> oh, I didn't see that. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Thank you so much. We're... <laughs> um, all right. It's time for some feedback. Um, Judge Anderson, would you want to start? Sure, I'll, I'll take a run at this. Um, uh, really enjoyed the exchange. In fact, you could tell we enjoyed the exchange because we refused to stop. So uh, <laughs> you could tell we were having a good time. Um, I loved your executive privilege answer. Uh, that just there's all kinds of things I could say about that, but I won't. Um, and your um, thinking on your feet answer about emergency powers is dead spot on. That is an area where Congress could very easily. Uh, well, in fact, if you look at their various statutes that give, you know, the president shall have the authority to declare an emergency. Um, that's that is broad authority that the Congress uh, could make a pretty good argument for re re reining back in. And of course, this whole last year, we've had discussions at, at individual state levels about whether or not um, the um, the emergency powers that are granted to the executive in the states uh, have been properly granted. Uh, Minnesota has featured uh, uh, this is a regular monthly occurrence. They have an argument about this. So um, I thought those were great responses. You demonstrate, uh, uh, you know, command of the material, and uh, um, you know, your citation of Watergate as a nonpartisan uh, investigation. I'm sure there'd be some who would quarrel with that. Um, I might be the oldest one here who uh, I actually um, recall this vividly. Um, I think there is a lot to recommend that as a bipartisan example. Uh, staff cooperated. Um, there was adequate funding for both the majority and the minority, um, and they proceeded cautiously. And, uh, you know, that there may be difficulty in thinking of a way to do this structurally, because it may be more a cultural problem than anything else. But boy, is it an issue. And you're right. All right. That's all I have. Thanks. Professor Chambers. Yeah, I, good, good conversation. I, I think the, the opening was good and strong, laid out a distinction between oversight and investigation. Uh, I, I, I think that, that at some points, you all were absolutely right in terms of moving forward on what Congress can do, uh, in terms of the structure of what Congress should do, a little, a little different issue. We asked the hard questions because you all look like you all were able to handle hard questions. Right, that's what that's what happened, and that is a show of respect. So I think y'all did a, a, a strong job, and clearly y'all have thought a lot about this the, these particular issues. So good job, and good luck moving forward. And I echo what my colleagues have said. I thought it was a great conversation. I thought that I think that this is a tough question. I think that it's kind of amorphous, and it's hard to sort of wrap your hands around it. And I thought you all did a good job. Um, I thought that you answered the question relatively directly. I thought that you had some pretty insightful answers to a couple of our questions. So job well done. And I hope that you know you have a lot of luck in the future.